So let's get started. We're going to spend the next 45 minutes to, to do what some of you were asking me. So to try to be very practical in uh, understanding the next time you look at a paper where there is some LTP, LTD, or some basic electrophysiology, to really try to be able to know what exactly that means for your studies and to be able to know if you would ask a colleague or a collaborator to do it and why. What does it give to your paper and how to interpret the data? And then, of course, I'm going to mix it with optogenetics because in another very practical way, I'm going to show you two examples of stories that uh, we did recently. We just published them on how you can use optogenetics, two very different ways, not uh, connected with each other. So, and again, stop me, because I'm going to go very slow, particularly with the electrophysiology parts. So the general idea <coughs> with electrophysiology is that you can think of substance abuse as a very chronic relapsing disease, and you can chase after long-term changes. What is an electrophysiological long-term change? Can be a change in synaptic transmission, right? Or can be a change in spike frequency. Somehow, any behavioral output, no matter what it is, has to change frequency of firing in your favorite brain region, given the disease that you want to study. No matter what the environmental stimuli, no matter what the genetic background, there has to be a shift in synapses, in ion channels from A to B. And basically, a lot of effort, and I'm going to show you an example at the end, is going to be made so that this shift, this chronic change in transmission can be reversed back to baseline, wipe out that change, that memory change in spike firing in transmission so that you can reverse behaviors as well. That's the very simple logic that my lab has followed basically for the last 15 years. And, and we've been studying dopamine for many years because I love psychiatry and neurology. I love to stay in between, right? So if you think of uh, dopamine, this is a short list of conditions. You have heard this from Marina, from others, but this is really a short list of conditions where dopamine is involved. And you can really pick and choose whatever you like. Dopamine has so many different faces and so many different effects in these behaviors and in these pathologies. That's why. I love it so much. And as a matter of fact, I love it so much that I married dopamine and this technique more than 20 years ago. This thing, this is a dopamine cell, and this is a fake glass electrode, right? This is called whole cell patch clamp. All the experiments I'm going to show you today are done with this technique. What does it mean? You basically, it's like a microsurgery, just to make sure that everybody's on board you identify one of these cells with your infrared microscope, this is a brain section, and then you poke a hole into this cell so that you put in communication your amplifier, which is up here, with this cell, okay? This measures on real time, millisecond by millisecond, the activity of your brain cells. It's the most powerful technique because it really follows and mimics how the brain talks with no delay millisecond by millisecond, okay? Once you establish a communication, you can do anything. You can turn on the intracellular messenger in you, and you, you can manipulate or screw up all the intracellular signaling. You can bus apply drugs so that the pharmacologist in you comes out with electrophysiology. You can use molecular biology and now switch and change the receptor subunits as you please, so you can really mix and match it with many other techniques. You can go in vivo, produce behaviors, and uh, then see what happens to this cell. So it's a perfect train station where many different techniques can be uh, coupled and combined, right? That's my real wife now. This one over here, which I married in 1994. See how beautiful she is. <laughs> and <laughs> mechanism of action of both after 20 <laughs> years, unknown, but... Uh, of course, that's another story. So uh, let's, let's get into synaptic plasticity and physiology now. So LTP, you have heard LTP for many years. You have stumbled on so many papers about LTP. And uh, LTP is all over the brain, right? We found it and others in the dopaminergic cells. It's, what, what is LTP? You guys know what it is. 
what it means. When you hear RCP, what do you think of? Jake. Of what? See, usually, usually when you see LTP, everybody refers automatically, by default, to this one receptor over here. Now we have expanded that concept, absolutely. But in general, you immediately go to AMPA receptors, this excitatory receptor, okay? So LTP usually used to mean these receptors are potentiated somehow in the long term. What does long term mean for synapses? <coughs> when do you cross the line between short term and long term? Do you guys know? You're not allowed to answer. <laughs> so, very simple. This normal <coughs> synaptic transmission happens in the order of milliseconds. Milliseconds. This is how long this AMPA current is lasting. 10 milliseconds. Then it's gone. Okay? This is normal transmission, no plasticity. When you engage into these things, LTP, long-term potentiation, be it of the AMPA receptors or of inhibitory synapses like GABA receptors, now the time changes. Usually above 15 minutes, which is a long time for synapses. That is kind of short-term LTP, but usually an hour, days, weeks, months, okay? So milliseconds, normal synaptic transmission, no plasticity. Minus hours, days, months, weeks, and whatnot, LTP, okay? So we show that LTP in this dopaminergic cells. I put this NMDA receptor here because if you block these NMDA receptors, as in many brain regions, LTP doesn't happen. Somehow calcium doesn't get in, you don't get these intracellular messengers that Angus is going to talk to you about, and AMPA receptors don't get phosphorylated or subunits don't get changed. The bottom line, if your NMDA receptors are blocked, there is no LTP, there is no plasticity of AMPA receptors. And basically, the <coughs> question that we started from answering, answering was, can drugs of abuse produce LTP. One thing that usually LTP is made of is electrical stimulation. You give a train of high-frequency stimuli in any brain region you like, and with this high-frequency stimulation, then minutes later you see LTP. But what we wanted to do was, okay, what about using a drug? <coughs> Let's use cocaine. Let's wait 24 hours and longer. Now, without that electrical stimulation, can we see potentiation? long-term potentiation of these AMPA receptors. And so, look at how we collect these experiments. So remember that cell I showed you before, that electrode, right? So you are now connected to a dopamine cell. And then you can evoke your AMPA currents, the ones that can give you the idea of LTP. You can evoke your NMDA currents, and basically you can measure, just as a very crude measure, the relative ratio of your AMPA receptors versus your NMDA receptors. This is a very rough way to get a sense on whether your synapses have changed and see what we saw here. After 24 hours after this cocaine exposure, the AMPA receptors to NMDA receptor ratio was increased. You see that peak, that's the AMPA current that has grown after cocaine exposure. It's larger. So, what a, yes, please, what Diane. Is it like, um, I don't know, like an hour after? So, so in the seven days, how long was the, the exposure? So um, this study was the first one we did mm -hmm. and was a single exposure to cocaine. Mm -hmm. And then, as a matter of fact, we did a lot of studies then. But basically, this data was collected 24 hours later. We waited five days, and it was still there. Two weeks, it was gone. But this plasticity shows up after three hours takes three hours to show up. As a matter of fact, for the first few minutes, the NMDA receptor goes up. Then that potentiation is very transient. It disappears, and then the AMPA receptor, the LTP of AMPA receptor, comes up and stays up for a week, basically. Okay? But uh, 
This is probably the most important part. You see lots of papers where you see a figure where there's LTP. LTP is enhanced. LTP is decreased. So the point I'm going to make here, which is very important, guys, don't forget, seeing a figure where there's only LTP doesn't really mean much. Or in other words, it doesn't give you a flavor for what's going on with your AMPA receptors. Look at what we found. We went with this electrical stimulation in these cocaine-treated animals to evoke LTP. Okay? Look at what happens. Nothing. Those are the controls. How's that? What's going on? What's going on is that your AMPA receptors are potentiated, right? That's what I just showed you before. So when you have an AMPA receptor that from baseline B is potentiated as a consequence of cocaine, you can try with electrical stimulation in your brain sections to potentiate it further, but basically you are at the ceiling. So the point I'm making is if you just try to stimulate with electrical stimulation, LTP, and you see a huge LTP or nothing, the other very important piece of information that you're going to ask to your collaborators is, okay, great, we see enhanced LTP in our study, but where is the AMPA receptor? Where in this space is my AMPA receptor? Is it depotentiated? That's why I see a larger potentiation when I use electrical stimulation. Is it already potentiated as a baseline as a consequence of my manipulation so that I can potentiate it even farther, or maybe I'm stuck at the ceiling. So it is very important to combine, I think, in general, the measure of LTP when you use the traditional in vitro electrical stimulation with other experiments that will give you a flavor for where your AMPA receptor is. Okay? And this is why we did this reverse experiment. Now we use the different protocol to depotentiate those AMPA receptors, LTD. Okay? So we wanted now to induce long-term depression. And in fact, look at what happened. In these cocaine-treated rats, the amplitude of depression was larger than in those controls. Because you imagine cocaine sets up your AMPA receptors to a potentiated state, so it's much easier to depotentiate them right? But there is no room to go up. But if we didn't know what was going on with our AMPA receptors, and we did a lot of other experiments that I'm going to show you to define where the AMPA receptor was, and it is potentiated. If you just saw this figure here, and you didn't see the figure I just showed you before, you would guess, okay, there's no LTP. Nothing is going on. But nothing is going on because you are already at ceiling. You're banging your head against the ceiling, okay? So the take-home message is whenever you ask one of your collaborators to study any form of synaptic plasticity in your studies, remember to get a sense on where your AMPA receptor stands. Where is it in this range, okay? Very simple. Is it clear? Great. That's the first point about plasticity and the most important one. This is why, you notice, we repeated the LTD protocol to cause desaturation, to basically take the AMPA receptors down to the floor. If we did it only once and then collected the data, we wouldn't know how much we can bring it down. But we repeatedly stimulate to depotentiate to the floor these AMPA receptors, and then they were clearly. And then we did a bunch of other stories. If you guys are curious, just curious to know why this LTP, this whole plasticity thing, can be important for uh, cocaine and whatnot, there are a bunch of papers that we published, Rob Malenka, Chris Lusher, Peter Calavas, and many others. So you can check all of them. But basically, this form of plasticity, Diane, as I mentioned before, lasts for about a week. And then it disappears. It depends on an MDA receptors in the VTA and it is responsible somehow for 
shaping context-dependent behavioral sensitization, this form of locomotor activity that you guys know about. If you block an MDA receptors, plasticity is gone, behavioral sensitization is gone. So if the cocaine, the single exposure, initiates all these synapses in the ceiling, does that suggest that it should impede learning of other associations that would evolve the same synapse? That's a great question. Uh, we have some partial answers to that question. Richard Palmiter made an NR1 knockout many years ago, and Rennish Panagel as well. Those knockouts have no NMDA receptor, so those mice cannot produce LTP. The caveat is they have, at baseline, a potentiated AMPA receptor, which is on this LTP spontaneous state. Some behaviors are normal in that. Some behaviors are screwed up. So what, what I'm telling you is we don't know yet, but we are doing, as we speak, finally convinced the postdoc, some occlusion experiments, exactly to, to answer your question. You potentiate the synapses at baseline through some tricks, cocaine and whatnot, what happens to other behaviors? What I can tell you, that study in PNAS showed something like that in regards to CPP and CPA. So basically, what Howard and Joe showed was that if you give a single cocaine exposure and if you produce this LTP, Condition place preference to morphine with using sub-threshold doses of morphine happens only during this time window during which there is LTP. So this plasticity enables CPP to morphine to be expressed and CPA as well, potentiated. So this is an amplifying signal for dopaminergic neurons irrespective of valence, CPA or CPP, which makes those two opposite behaviors, but both salient, more likely to happen in a nutshell, okay? Then, guys, if you give now repeated cocaine exposures, nothing changes. This is passive exposures, and when you stop your repeated injections, after five days, like with a single cocaine exposure, plasticity, poof, is gone. But the big thing that really I still find pretty amazing is that now if you train your rats to self-administer cocaine for a few weeks and then you stop exposing them to cocaine and you go and measure these AMPA receptors, this plasticity, after more than three months, you still have LTP on these dopaminergic cells. So this is very long-lasting, but only when you have an operant behavior when they actually do something to get cocaine. The yoked controls, the ones that got cocaine as much as these guys, no LTP whatsoever. So the associative learning, engagement from many different regions is fundamental for producing this form of plasticity. Okay? And what about sucrose simple Pavlovian conditioning? We know this part of the answer met because when Garrett did that study, he showed that on day three, okay, we had a procedure, Q-reward association, sucrose, tone, as simple as that, five sessions once a day. By day three, these rats got it. They associated this Q with the ability to get sucrose. Day three is the only day where they show LTP. The day they get it, then it's gone. This is a physiological behavior. There's no cocaine on board. They produce LTP. But as you can imagine, these synapses are going back to baseline the moment they learn something new and salient because they must be ready to be flexible again, to be potentiated or depotentiated. Okay? So physiological synaptic plasticity up and down AMPA receptors in dopaminergic cells, synaptic rigidity doesn't go down, stays stuck up there for as long as three months of complete abstinence from cocaine. And this yes. Works with the same thing with heroin. With heroin? Yeah. No one has done it. For practical, only for practical reasons, Brigitte time-consuming, it's a pain in your butt to recover from these cells, from these animals, which are like, now they are six months old, 
the midbrain is extremely small, no one is doing it. I wish someone did it. Right? I do. I do because we know that a single morphine exposure produces LTP, like a single nicotine exposure, single amphetamine exposure, and whatnot. So I would say yes, very likely. So then, then guys, everything changed. Now we're shifting to optogenetics. Then we were stuck, basically, really, in 2005-ish, with having no idea <coughs> in terms of associative learning, pathways that were controlling behaviors. Uh, we could only measure one cell at a time or a brain region at a time. And then, you know, Carl and Ed came along and they just developed what, what we now know as, as optogenetics. So <coughs> you guys know about these two organisms, right? This is where the channel rhodopsin comes from, Chlamydomonas, which, is, which has a light-sensitive protein and this other bacteria, which is in the Dead Sea, which has a light-sensitive protein that, as opposed to the channel rhodopsin, is a chloride conductance and will shut down the cells where it's expressed. Okay. So, channel rhodopsin excitation, as you know, halorhodopsin inhibition, Dead Sea inhibition. There are three components to every virus you will ever build, you will ever ask your friends to build for you when you want to do optogenetic experiments. One component gives it specificity. You've got to choose the best promoter you have. As you guys know, I'm not a molecular biologist, but the size of the promoter you need makes a huge difference. So the larger it is, the more complicated it's going to make your life. But basically, you can choose TH, you can choose DBH, you can choose many, many different promoters now, depending on what is your question. And then you have the channel rhodopsin or the halorhodopsin, excitation, inhibition, channel and halo. And then you need to see the cells that you have infected with your virus, right? So you need a visibility portion. Could be a YFP, an RFP now, GFP and whatnot. So these are the three key components that you will pay attention to when you go to talk to your collaborators and ask them to build you a virus to do your experiments. What virus do you choose? It really depends on many different labs. Some people are very happy with lentiviruses. We were not. We use AAVs. Now you have herpes. It really depends also on what kind of question you're going to ask. And what I mean is, once again, time-wise. Some of these viruses are toxic. You can do very short-term experiments. That toxicity is a huge problem. You've got to pay a lot of attention to it. Some experiments are long-term. You have to be very careful to choose certain viruses. Experiments are short-term. You inject them. You wait expression. You study your synapses. You're gone. No behaviors. Then you can choose even more aggressive viruses, and it's going to be OK. But toxicity, long-term of your experiments are the two things that you have to ask your collaborators and to really pay attention to, okay? And, and basically, <coughs> the question that we tailored with John Britt was, I think, one of the fundamental questions for the central nervous system. What is the relationship between synaptic strength and the expression of behaviors, right? It doesn't get more basic than that. So, what did John do? He is very interested in the nucleus accumbens shell. We'll hear much more about it from David tomorrow as well. But the nucleus accumbens is driving a lot of goal-directed behaviors. Okay. It's very important for everything, food, motivation to do anything, drugs of abuse, you name it. Goal-directed behaviors, that's where you look at the nucleus accumbens. And what John did was he wanted to compare three of the main glutamatergic afferents to the nucleus accumbens to see which one was the weakest or the strongest and which one had anything to do with cocaine. Okay, so he injected basically this AAV which has chemkinase 2 as a promoter. Basically imagine in either of these brain regions all your pyramidal cells being infected. It's a non-specific promoter. You infect all of them one at a time, series of experiments with a PFC infected. You wait about three, four weeks the virus goes down the axon, 
to the Nucleosa Kamen shell. And then you stimulate with your laser just the terminals. So that when you shine light in the Nucleosa Kamen shell, basically, as you can imagine, only the fibers from the PSC or the BLA, the basolateral amygdala, which we've heard a lot about, or the ventral hippocampus will be activated. All the other two million fibers will be silenced. No, no communication. So what did John see? First of all, very crude measure. You blast your brain section with light. Which one is giving you the strongest response? Well, it's the ventral hippocampus the largest response by far, huge, huge responses. So that gives you already a very important piece of information and pretty surprising. The PFC is a very wimpy pathway to the nucleus accumbens, and we infected a lot of it. It's weak, <coughs> which is pretty unexpected. I was imagining much stronger input, okay? But the ventral hippocampus drives most of it, first thing. And then, now this is the funny part for the electrophysiologist in you. You can get a little bit deeper and now start digging on, okay, what does it mean? What's controlling this strength? What are the differences? What is the identity card of these three different pathways and how we can use electrophysiology to figure it out? And as you know, the size of this excitatory postsynaptic responses, these are AMPA currents, produced by accumulation of quanta, vesicles being released, the size of it depends on, well, how many vesicles are being released, PR, right? The size of each quanta and the number of synapses, the number of connections of release sites. So you can measure these things in many different ways. First of all, you can start to measure what we call the probability of release. And you can use something very, very simple, which is called PERT pulse ratio. Uh, have you guys ever stumbled on this thing on your papers? Right? Yes. Do, do you know what it is? How do we measure it? Do you remember? You just apply two pulses. You apply two pulses. And then you record the size of the two PCRPs. Great. And you compare the ratio of the second one and the first one. Exactly. And we have two possibilities, right? Mm -hmm. One possibility, you look at the green one, the big one. The second pulse gives a smaller response than the first. This is all optical evoked. So first response big, second response smaller. What, what does it mean? Do you remember what we generally think it means in terms of probability of release? There's, I can. there's a decreased probability of release. So... There is less release on the second one, right? Same pulse now is giving less release. And in general, we think that that is because this is a high probability of release synapse. The first pulse is releasing a lot of glutamate. This is a big response. And the second pulse doesn't have much left ready to be released, less because the first pass did a lot of it already. So high probability of release per pulse depression. If you have the opposite case, like the first pass now is giving you a smaller response than the second, okay, that means low probability of release because the first pass is releasing glutamate, and then you have some sort of sensitization in your presynaptic fiber, calcium, cyclic MP, and whatnot, so that when the second pass arrives, 50 milliseconds later, everything is ready to be released, but there is neurotransmitter ready to be released because the first pass wasn't as efficient <coughs> as before. So basically, first pass sensitizes this presynaptic terminal, the second pass comes in, there's a lot of vesicles to be released, and it does it. Lower probability of release. The first pulse is your reference to measure and say high probability of release, low probability of release. So to summarize, depression, first pulse releases most of it, high probability of release, 
third pulse facilitation, the first pulse is not as efficient as the second, low probability of release. Am I making sense? Okay. So, this figure is telling you the probability of release is not the explanation on why the ventral hippocampus is stronger than the others because it doesn't have anything different from the PFC, which is a very tiny input. Yes? They are different sizes, so yes. Yeah. the convergence of the inputs, how do you take that into consideration? You know, you're not getting every cell in the ventral hippocampus no. that's projecting out, yet it's still your strongest input. So that, yeah. I think, says a lot. And you think maybe you're getting the entire amygdala, because it's quite small in comparison, but you can inject a, a big volume. It's, it's a very good question, Matt. You have many different ways to do that. We we are, we're not going to get into it, but we measure the intensity of fluorescence we inject always the same amount of virus, 0.3 microliters and whatnot. That's one thing. Second, you're right, you cannot be sure 100%. But electrophysiology guides you, and I'll tell you why in a second. The second thing is you measure the intensity <coughs> of fluorescence in the terminus to kind of guess you know, how much you have infected. But the third thing is that by using electrophysiological tricks, you can tune down your intensity of stimulation to basically evoke release from as low as a single fiber, what is called minimal stimulation. And this is another trick, for example, to measure, irrespective of the size of your responses, how much quanta release per fiber you have. Because you can never exclude that you are not stimulating more or less fibers. All you know is how much virus you inject, the intensity of your fluorescence. But, but for example, in this case, the trick we used here, that's a perfect question to get into this, is to use strontium, which is a metal that desynchronizes your release. It breaks down your nice EPSC, your nice current, into pieces because your quanta are being desynchronized. They don't get released at the same time, but they get scattered. What does it mean? That you can measure each one of them and how much glutamate they release. So yes. Exactly. Exactly. The advantage here is that you don't have the variable of waiting for a mini EPSC, a spontaneous thing to show up. You evoke it with your light stimulation, but then you break it into pieces and turn them into minis, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, and whatnot by using this compound, this metal that basically breaks them down. And, and then you measure the size of them. And this is telling you, once again, the size of these units is very similar between pathways. So that's not it. It's not that the hippocampus is huge because it has huge vesicles releasing tons of glutamate. It's not because of that. Okay. Am I making sense? John. The previous slide for the near pulse facilitation, you show an <coughs> enhancement to the amygdala. What's the significance of that? It just says, Jonathan, that the amygdala, compared to the others, is the only one that shows first pass depression, first pass facilitation that has, at baseline, physiologically, a lower probability of release of glutamate than the other pathways. But what this figure is telling you that the PFC and the ventral hippocampus are high probability of release inputs to the accumbens, but they are very different in size. So the probability of release doesn't explain why they are so different in size. That, that was the only point we wanted to make here. Making sense? Okay. And, and then... Long story short, we turn to cocaine. So what, what does it happen now if you throw cocaine to this rat, to, to, to this mice? Basically, so you can treat them, you know, to induce <laughs> behavioral sensitization, repeated cocaine exposure, you wait 
couple of weeks, is there any form of plasticity specific to one pathway or another? Turns out, this is the beauty of optogenetics, that now you don't say anymore, and this is a huge conceptual shift, the nucleus accumbens is showing LTP as a consequence of cocaine exposure. What we can say now, because of this, is the ventral subiculum of the hippocampus is sending a projection to the nucleus accumbens shell and is the only projection that shows synaptic plasticity. Look at your ampere receptors here, two weeks after that cocaine exposure. Huge. Look at them. Not so big. One pathway, the others completely untouched by cocaine. So think of ethanol, stress, morphine, feeding behaviors, anything you love, applying this mechanism. Now you start dissecting among this very int intricate set of 2,000 highways, which one of them are really carrying the signal, the information, after your manipulation, whatever is your favorite disease or condition that you want to study. Only the ventral hippocampus to a canvas pathway shows huge potentiation. Okay, so the amplitude, sorry. So what's the um, line on the bottom and the line on the top? That's so the line on the bottom? Which, which one, yeah. Jonathan? You show two figures. I mean, you have superimposed. So, oh, sorry, around. okay, what yes. The so the, the, the short, sorry, Jonathan, I need to make it clear. The quick response, the tiny one, is the AMPA response, okay? And the long one, the slow one, is the NMDA receptor response. This is a number to an MDA ratio, the crudest measure of changes in these two receptors that we can get. It's very sensitive, very nonspecific. And what we see is AMPA to an MDA ratio, saline control, it's whatever the number is, one, no, yes, 0.8. After cocaine, 1.5. The AMPA goes way up and the NMDA stays more or less the same. So, a huge shift in plasticity, okay? Only this pathway. The other pathways, they don't care. And the amplitude of those quantal events, going back to measuring this thing is not enough, is also changed. Now, the size of the glutamate release in this pathway is 50% larger asynchronous release, okay, compared to the saline control. So then you can also measure something else if you really love electrophysiology. You can go and take a look at something else. And, and what actually Joe was mentioning the other night at his uh, post, as, at his short presentation, that you can also get the precise identity in terms of subunit expression of your AMPA receptors or your NMD receptors. How do you do that? You basically drive your AMPA receptor from a very hyperpolarized potential, let's say minus 80 millivolts, below the resting membrane potential of your cell. And then you drive it up, up, up to plus 40 millivolts. Why you do that? Because depending on the receptor subunits of your AMPA receptor, you can see sort of a linear conductance. This is how much current goes through your ampere receptor at different potentials, linear, or if you have this calcium permeable subunit, the two subunit, the GLUR2, you would see rectification. You basically would see that at depolarized potentials, the ampere receptors that contain this GLUR2 subunit do not let go current through. They don't work. But what John saw here is that this change, this plasticity, doesn't depend on a shift in subunits of your ampere receptors. That's another trick. When you go to one of your collaborators and you want to study your LTP ampere receptors, you can ask them, okay, what about the subunit compositions? Have you studied the rectification of your channels? Have you tested that? These, these are actually simple experiments to do once you know them, but in just a few minutes, you get a sense on what's going on with your You can almost see your ampere receptor and the subunits and what happens to them just by measuring their conductance, okay? Calcium permeable, 
flat line. No calcium permeability, straight line. Okay? Great. Yes. Okay, so a lot of people now are doing these multi electrode arrays. Yes. No, no, there is no, no way, no, unfortunately no. You, you get a different kind of information, not, not this kind, no, it's not possible. You can go in vivo and do whole cell patch clamp recordings which are very difficult but feasible. We, we did it, Rob Fremke here at NYU does it. It's feasible but it's a huge pain, huge, huge pain. But uh, there's no other way, Chris. Unfortunately. And, and then, guys, you, you can go back to the behaviors to try to prove causality, and then we're go we are done and we're moving to the final story very quickly. So, okay, if this pathway means anything, because it's potentiated by cocaine, then we go back to the in vivo part with cocaine, and we are going to play with it now. And what we did was to either <coughs> turn on channel rhodopsin in vivo to stimulate the ventral subiculum to accumbens pathway after cocaine exposure. The prediction is, well, this pathway is potentiated, as I showed you before. Now, let's turn it on during exposure to cocaine and see what happens. If it means anything, it should actually shape locomotor activity to cocaine. And in fact, it did. When you give cocaine but you turn on this pathway, ventral subiculum to accumbens, low frequency, the locomotor activity response is much higher, okay? And when you turn it off, cocaine has a much smaller effect on locomotor activity than control. So it's not only potentiated by cocaine. If you selectively inhibit or activate this pathway, you change the behavior of these animals. Matt? So what about stimulating without cocaine? That's it. Without, oh, sorry. Stimulating with light without cocaine, does it drive locomotion? It doesn't. It's a great question. What, what it does, it's a different set of experiments that, that we did. The, there were studies by Paul German and Howard Fields that measured CPP. I'm not going to talk about them today because I want to get you guys to the final point. And uh, so basically what this pathway shapes is the time you spend on an area that you like and not. And your transition from one part to the other of these boxes where you enjoy being or not. With all these calculations, basically, this pathway does that. That's what we started very clearly. So you can tune it and see that happening. If you turn halorhodopsin on, they don't move anymore, but if you turn this on, they actually run to the area that they prefer, and you can calculate with these equations how much time. Taking in their drive. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So the spatial component of motivation and reward is controlled physiologically by this pathway. We, we have it in the paper, but don't want to get too far away from, from that today. I, I can send it to you if you like. So the bottom line of what I wanted to show you guys now, forget that we use cocaine. Think of whatever you like. You can compare pathways that are very important to you. We're thinking of Jake and his project, but many, many others of you. And then you can compare them. Well, several of these pathways are relevant for cocaine, for all these reward-related behaviors and substance abuse. But which one of them is more important? Is one of them that is necessary or sufficient to drive any of your behaviors? This is the way to go. Very simple, but you can see how far you can go with some very simple manipulation. Okay? Yes, Anthony. Um, so if you were to use a different behavioral procedure with the cocaine administration, do you think that you might shift which brain region is having the strongest input, or is it is the strength of the hippocampal input the nucleus hominis going to basically like override and maybe the other ones that? It's entirely possible. We, we don't know. We will see many of these studies. This was the first of its kind, but I'm sure that we'll have many, many more. And many people are working on these similar questions. I, I would predict, and I will show you, 
that different pathways have very different roles and different behaviors. We're, we're going to get into a behavior that David developed a few years ago, and everything changes. So you'll get a partial answer in the next part. So basically, the sum, yes, it's perfect that you're here, so you, you can explain the behavioral part of it. If they have questions, she's going to answer for me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this hippocampal inputs from the ventral subiculum to the nucleus accumbens shell are appearing as extremely important to drive locomotor sensitization for cocaine and plasticity. They show plasticity. And most importantly, we went back the full circle to now demonstrate that there's not just plasticity, that you tune that pathway, you actually have an effect on the behavior that you started from. So you have to close this loop in order to finish the story. Okay? That's what John did. And a lot of extra experiments that you don't care about. It. But the second part is that PFC pathway left Billy with this sour taste in his mind. He said, you know, PFC is important. Why didn't you do anything? And, uh, and, and the idea that Billy had was to really start from the behavior that David developed, which is the most complex, but I think the most sophisticated behavioral procedure we have to study substance abuse, and, uh, and see something else. See whether you can use now optogenetics as a treatment for cocaine. And I'll tell you how close to humans is that in just a minute. So this behavior was developed by David and a few others a few years ago. And the key component of this, besides taking forever to be developed and, and pushing Billy to the edge of suicide, <laughs> is that it, <laughs> it has this compulsive and very human component. Basically, these rats are trained for many, many weeks to self-administer cocaine, okay? There is a chain. You have to press two levers, first the sick lever, then there is a random interval in between them, then the take lever, and then you get your cocaine. And this goes on and on and on for many, many weeks. Then, once you have solidified this behavior, they press the two levers, they get cocaine. Then you have four days four sessions, once a day, where you introduce a random shock. And see what happens. With this random shock, you have that 70% of them in our hands quit taking cocaine. They stop really seeking, pressing that sick lever. They just don't press it anymore. 70, 7 out of 10 of them. But we have this hardcore group of 30% of them which don't care at all about being shocked. They just keep on taking cocaine. I'm going to show you one of them so that you will remember. What do you see here? You see three cannulas, okay? One is where cocaine goes, <coughs> and the other two were the optogenetic implants. Before the experiment started, Bill injected that virus that I told you before, that AV, into the prelimbic portion of the prefrontal cortex. The prelimbic is one of those key brain regions that humans have actually uh, hypoactive after chronic cocaine exposure, the equivalent in humans. And uh, so the general dopsins were already injected, not active yet. And basically, you see an example of one of these shock-resistant rats. He's really waiting to be able to press the lever and to get his cocaine very anxiously. And uh, you will see in a second, he's just going to jump back, basically, just a little bit. He's waiting, waiting. He really wants his cocaine. He tries to find it, turning around, and now you'll notice he's jumping back. Very mild food shock, but he will keep on going forever. What happens to his prefrontal cortex, to his prelimbic cortex? He's silent, quiet. These are in vivo experiments normal control, your fine activity, naive, cocaine exposure, quiet. How can you define that better? You can use, once again, it's quite a love electrophysiology, very simple tricks to now get a little bit deeper into how hypoactive is this brain region. Well, you can cut brain sections, okay, and you can give a small step of current to your prefrontal cell. And this is a given intensity, L let's say 200 picoins. And you evoke an action potential. But 
in the shock sensitive animals it actually takes a little bit more current to evoke an actual potential in the shock resistant it takes more and more to evoke a single action potential so the bottom line is and we did it even better here you can evoke with these depolarizing steps with these injections of current a lot of action potentials in this naive control some action potentials in these shock sensitive threads and almost nothing very quiet prelimbic cortex in them and this is a measure of everything so basically with this very simple procedure you get a picture of what's going on in your PFC by giving fixed amount of excitation to your prefrontal prelimbic cells you see basically no action potentials in the shock resistance some in the shock sensitive and a lot in the other we measured all of these things nothing changed we couldn't find a postsynaptic measure that was clearly responsible for that so we, we measure all the principal potassium conductances basically and what not we couldn't identify an ion channel which is saying Jonathan that there is a presynaptic component which is mainly driving these cells to be silent they are just not active spontaneously. So now, how to use optogenetics? You have a very quiet prefrontal cortex. You have these compulsive rats. So what Billy wanted to do, this is the end of it, is turn it on with channel rhodopsin. It's like inserting a pacemaker in your heart. Okay. So. As I mentioned before, he injected them way before he started the experiments. He didn't know which one was going to turn shock sensitive, shock resistant. And then he recorded in vivo. And as you can see here, the fluorescence is there. The prelimbic cortex is infected. You can use light to evoke your action potentials and your current. So the injection worked and whatnot. And now, during these sessions, right? Channel adoption simulation was turned on at the very low frequency, one hertz, really like a heart pacemaker, throughout this sick period. And see what happens now. First of all, what do you notice? Hmm? It doesn't care anymore. Bilateral stimulation, one hertz. This is not. DBS, 130 Hz, 1 Hz, really, very small. He doesn't care anymore. But the most important control, if you turn on channel rhodopsins before you make them shock resistant, channel rhodopsin has no effect. So this is not an artifact, just because you are turning on some alien stimulation from outside. It's not because of that. It only works when you have shock-resistant rats. They just quit seeking for cocaine, and that's the summary. That's the bottom line, right? Latency to press goes up, interpress interval goes up, and number of level presses goes down. But the final experiment that was, I think, the coolest one, can you now turn the shock-sensitive rats into shock resistance? Can you make them become compulsive? cocaine seekers. How do you do that? There you go. And you can. Nine months later, like a baby was born, this figure, <laughs> this is the baby that <laughs> took nine months to, to build, it's true. <laughs> oh, so under control, baseline control conditions, halorhodopsin, fine, everything is fine. But then, after you turn the shock resistant, sorry, the shock sensitive into shock sensitive, you turn on halorhodopsin, they start going <coughs> back to cocaine. They seek to level press, and basically they press as opposed to no presses at all before. Latency to seek goes down, interpress interval goes down. So you can turn one or the other into addicted, so to speak, very loosely, 
or not addicted, okay? And that's the summary of everything, etc. I want to skip it. So what? Yes. After you've done the treatment, right, and you then turn off the stimulation and you put the animals back in, do they return to the previous behavior or are you have permanently reversed it? We don't know. Each one of these animals took six months to train. That's the downside. <laughs> he knows what I'm talking yeah, about. So there, there, no, no experiment, no extra experiment was done unless it was strictly necessary to get the paper published, Jonathan. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm serious. Animals, it took. Right? Sorry. You still uh, do you still have those animals? No, he he kept the brains and froze them and whatnot. We we don't. No, it's it's a shame. I know it's a shame, but. But uh, four years later, and one paper later, we, we didn't do a single additional experiment because we just couldn't afford it. We had no time, nothing. So we just got this thing. So th th there are tons of things to do. That's a great one. I'm seeking volunteers, <laughs> if anyone wants to do it. Now, what, what is so cool about this thing? Th think about the therapy now. Think about... You know, do you guys know how long it takes to go from a uh, medication, a discovery, right, to patients? The average time, do you know how long is that? 10, 15? Yeah. We are starting clinical trials as we speak. How, how can we do that in humans? What are we doing? You, you can stimulate the brain. So you, you have two ways. Switzerland, for example, is investing a lot into deep brain stimulation, which is very precise, but it's invasive. We are taking a softer approach, and we are trying to bet on TMS, you know, because TMS, now there are new coils. A couple of companies are producing these wonderful coils that actually can give you deep stimulation of actually medium structures, su such as the prelimbic cortex and whatnot. So basically, we are designing clinical trials as we speak. We have tons of people who want to do this because it's non-invasive. You only have to make sure that you don't produce seizures because, as you guys know, TMS has been used for OCD, for depression. <laughs> yeah, it's... it's, it's <laughs> huh? Maybe you should explain what TMS is. So do, do you guys know what TMS is? Sorry, transcranial magnetic stimulation. So basically, you put this coil, it's an electro electromagnetic field with this big probe. It's like a gigantic ultrasound probe on the top of your head. And based on the shape of these coils, you can induce an electrical and a magnetic field into your brain in certain areas. You can target them, not as precise as optogenetics, but you can target it, and you produce stimulation. And you can choose the frequency and intensity. So there are no serious side effects. You have to be careful to not cause seizures, but that happened a long time ago. So it has been used in patients for many, many years. So it's not a problem now, but basically it's an opportunity to go with it. Yes? But it doesn't matter. It is less specific, <coughs> absolutely, but, but the beauty of the promoter we use is that it's the least specific promoter you can imagine. So the pyramidal cells, at the end of the day, Brigitte, are driving everything there. So, so you would imagine that, like with optogenetics, that we didn't select only for pyramidal cells. By all means, TMS is not specific, but you, you know what? There is a chance that it might work. And, and, and so we are giving up on specificity, but it's like a very low hanging. Yes, you may. I mean, your neuron of interest may be the winner in the end, right? Exactly, exactly. And because of the human studies, the equivalent of the prelimbic cortex are the area 24, the area 30. They are exactly the areas that, you know, that, that Hugh Garavan, Nora, Rita Goldstein have shown to be hypoactive in humans. It's, it's one of those golden opportunities. So, uh, Diane, yes. I have a question about which area are you targeting? Those are anterior cingulae. So basically, area 24 and area 30. Yes. 
a lot of people are. There is a guy at Harvard who's working with Bruce Rosen, Tommy Raj, who's studying that exactly. As a matter of fact, we are trying to hire him as a TMS core director in the intramural program. But there are people now that are beginning to study that. What does it happen when you use TMS? Coils are developed as we speak, so it's really a beginning of something. But, uh, you know, it's worth trying and playing with it. The, the final thing I want to say, and then I'm going to stop, is to remind you guys in two seconds why you should keep also dread in mind. What, what is the main difference between general dopsins and dread? The difference is that for all of the ones of you that want to do behavioral studies, a dread approach, which, as you remember, what, what, what actually uh, Paul said the other day, is that you insert a receptor that only responds to the exogenous artificial drug that you give. The advantage of dread, very different from general dopsins, is that you can inject it systemically. You can put it into a brain region, but the bottom line, it doesn't have the constraints, the temporal constraints of general dopsins. You can do long behavioral experiments that last for an hour or two with dread on board and know that that cluster of cells is shut down. With general dopsins, you cannot really keep cells healthy and silent for two hours. You will burn and fry your brain, right? So, so think of dread in a nutshell, and Brian Roth and many others, I put some references here for you, have written beautiful reviews. Think of dread every time you were tempted to use general dopsins but you need a much longer lasting effect. We are talking about long term, really. Effect. General dopsins have the beauty of being able to stimulate millisecond by millisecond, but they don't do what threats do. So that's the only take home message I want to give you, and I'm going to stop right here. So if you have any more questions. <laughs> yes. I have it here. Let me see if I can find it. It does work, and it works beautifully. There you go. Ta-da. It does work, uh, by all means. Y you can use it in slices, too. It's, uh, if you're going for slices, why not channel rhodopsins, right? They, they are so precise, and with channel rhodopsins, you can inactivate cells for a minute or two. But by all means, it works. This is a slide by Garrett Stuber, actually. Garrett gave it to me yesterday. Yes, Matt? It's just one thing to keep in mind, though. You, for the HM4D to work well, at least with that kind of a temporal response to the drug, there has to be some like, GERD channels expressed in those cells. If not, Absolutely. the reduction in excitability, it still happens, but it takes minutes. And because they, they're not like a rapid ionic current opening, but something else that changes electrical excitability, like a down regulation of and yeah, and and yeah, because there are GIO. There are both GS and GI. Absolutely, absolutely. So you you have both flavors now, but it, it really depends. Usually, you never do one experiment at a time. So what the answer I would give you, if your slice experiment is coupled to a pure behavioral experiment, then it's okay to use thread. But if you're planning to study synapses as well then, you know, try to catch always three, four birds with one stone. So that's how I, I reason usually. So, yeah. Any other questions or are we taking a break? We're taking a break. Great. Now, uh